We've been talking about integrals and antiderivatives, but today we're going to take kind of a detour into a topic that will seem unrelated at first. We're going to talk about area. Specifically, we're going to be in a situation where we have a function and we want to find the area underneath that function or underneath that curve. So we'll have y equals f of x defined on some interval from some a to some b on the x-axis. We're going to assume here that that f is a non-negative function, that it, it, it the curve is always above the x-axis. That means that if we draw the lines, the, the vertical lines at a and b, those will kind of cut off a region, a region that we'll call r. This has has four boundary pieces. It has, it has the x-axis, it has the line x equals a, x equals b, and then it has the, the curve up here at the top. It is possible for, say, the curve to actually hit the x-axis. We're only assuming it's non-negative, not that it's specifically positive. So maybe one or more of these these um, boundary pieces just becomes a a line of length zero. But that that's not that's not really going to affect anything that we do with it. The point is that we're going to give a name to this area, the area of this region. We're going to call this the definite integral of the function over that interval. Or more, more frequently, we'll, actually, we'll call a and b, and instead of just talking about the interval, we'll call those the limits of integration. We're going to write this very similar to the indefinite integral, but we need to incorporate the a and b into, into our notation. We'll still kind of write it as an integral sign of f of x dx, but we're going to put the a and b on the integral sign. Now the question you probably have is why are we giving this the name integral? Why, how is this related to any of the the stuff that we had before. Well, that is actually one of the big results of calculus, that this seemingly unrelated area of top, this topic of area, kind of switching my words around there, this unrelated topic of area turns out to be related directly to antiderivatives. And that's through what we call the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's a big fancy name because it is just as important as, as it's making it seem. This says if f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, then the, the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A where this capital F is any antiderivative. A little f on the interval. So in fact, if you can find an antiderivative of a function, you can find the area under the curve, that, that the, the graph of that function. Now this is actually not as difficult to prove, at least give a sketch of the proof, as it might seem. It might seem how, how are we going to connect the idea of area to antiderivatives in any way? Well, we're going to make what we call an area function function a of x. It's going to be the integral from a to some variable x. When we write down our our actual integral, we're going to have to go ahead and put a different letter in here, just because we put x there. 
But the idea here is that we have our our curve that, that we're trying to take. We have some starting point A. Ultimately, we want to get, get over here to this B, but we'll just pick some point in the middle. All right, I want to stick with that X. We have some point in the, the middle X, and we're only looking at this portion of the area so far. But as, as we allow this X to move, we can go all the way from A all the way to B. But this is, this is now a function. And because it's a function, we can do stuff with it. Specifically, we could take as derivative. What is the derivative of A? Now, of course, we're going to have to use our limit definition here. Take the limit as x goes to, uh, delta x goes to 0. Technically, we could write this as a, as a fraction. It gets a little messy if we try to do that. Well, I guess if, let's write it as the, in terms of, of A first. So remember, we have a difference of A of x plus delta x minus A of x. We divide by delta x, and then we take that limit. A of delta x, of course, is this area that we have here. A of x plus delta x, well, all we're really doing there is taking a point kind of close to x. We'll say this is x plus delta x, and which case what we're really saying is that the distance between these two points on our x-axis is delta x. Now, I am also drawing this as if delta x is specifically positive. We could have it be negative and be on the other side. That's not really going to be too important to do right here. But th this a of x plus delta x is now the area from a to here. So, we, so really, we just have a little bit more tacked on. And when we take this difference, really what we're doing is just kind of taking out the part from a to x. At least if delta x is a positive number. And so this, di this di difference right here is really just the area between these two lines. And as delta x goes to 0, this is a, a really thin region. It's a very small area. In fact, we can actually kind of think of that as like kind of kind of a little really thin rectangle. Technically, here the function isn't necessarily horizontal at the top, so it's not not necessarily going to be a rectangle, but maybe it's close enough to think of it as one. So we are going to approximate this small area as just a small rectangle. That means its, its width is delta x. Its height, well, we're going to have to use the, the point on the, a, a point on the function. And we might as well just take the point at x. We're just going to say, well, here we have the point x, f of x. How about we take that f of x as the height of the rectangle? So that rectangle, well actually let's say the, the difference is approximately the, a rectangle. And the, or the area of the rectangle specifically. And that rectangle has area of f of x of, for, for the height and then delta x for the width. And that means as we take our limit and being able to, to, to really use this this approximation in the limit really does require the continuity condition that, that we said at, when we stated the theorem. Um, not getting into any messy details here. This is actually really a, a, a finicky thing to prove very formally, but the idea of the proof is very simple. But so we're we're just going to go ahead and put put this in for our difference. That means on top of our fraction we have f of x delta x. On the bottom we have delta x. 
of course, we can get rid of the delta x's. They cancel each other out. And now there's no delta x's left. We're just left with f of x. So the limit is just f of x. Specifically here, we found out that the derivative of this area function is just the function, the, the f, that we started with. That means that a is an antiderivative of f. It may not specifically be this same antiderivative that we have here, this, this capital F. And we're, we want to say that any antiderivative can be used. We don't want to have to specifically look for one antiderivative. But we do know specifically that any antiderivatives of the same function have to only differ by a constant. That means this, this a of x has to be that capital F of X plus some C. And we can find that C pretty easily just, just by plugging in a number. I'm going to go ahead and pick A. If I plug A into my area function, over here I have F of A plus C, but I know what capital A of little a is. Because all that's really saying is the area if we start at A and end at A, just be kind of trying to say what is the area of this this vertical line here. And of course that's going to just be zero. That means C has to be, since, since F of A plus C has to equal zero, C has to be negative of F of A. And that means that capital A of X has to be f of x minus f of a. And if we go ahead and do the entire integral from a to b, that's just capital a, capital a of b. That's what we get if we, if we let x go all the way to b. And so we're going to get f of b by putting the b in here, and then the c was minus f of a. And that is the formula that we got back here. So really it came down to being able to take a derivative and then make, it, make a, a nice approximation. Noticing that, that these areas are, are nice enough behaved. At this stage we also want to kind of drop the, the constraint of only being able to work with non-negative functions. We, we did that because we want to be able to just talk about areas. If we allow a function to go negative, if we, if we have a function like this, where part of it goes negative, we can't really just say that the integral is the area between that, that function and the x-axis. That, that doesn't quite work. We can, we can still talk about the definite integral using, using our fundamental theorem of calculus formula, though. We can still say, even if this, we have this more complicated looking function, that the integral from a to b of f of x is still capital F of b minus capital F of a for some antiderivative capital F. What this is going to do in kind of geometrically here is is represent areas underneath the x-axis as negative areas. So you could say, well, we find some area here, some a, maybe an a1 there, an a2 there, a3 there. Those are all areas as you would expect them to be if you were to literally just have them on a piece of paper and think of them as, as areas you're trying to find. But the integral would really be saying we take a1 minus a2 and plus a3. The part that's below the x-axis has to be treated as a negative area. Another thing that the fundamental theorem actually does that the book doesn't stress is that it guarantees that any continuous function on a closed interval has an antiderivative. That's not true for differentiation, by the way. 
if we have a continuous function, it could be something like y equals the absolute value of x, where, where we have this sharp corner at 0. There's no derivative at that point. And we could find even worse behaved functions, functions that aren't that don't have derivatives on many different points. We can, we can actually go get pretty crazy with that kind of an idea. But we still have a continuous function here. That means that while integration can be a lot more difficult to do than differentiation was, it is in some ways a better behaved type of operation. It it doesn't have the, the issue where ni nice looking functions just don't have derivatives. But every nice fun nice continuous function does have an antiderivative. We can always technically integrate any continuous function. Just maybe not be able to find an, a nice formula for it. That, that's kind of the, the issue. We also gain some, some properties of definite integrals. Uh, some of these come directly from the fact that they work for indefinite integrals. Things like the integral from a to b of some constant times a function is the same thing as if we take that constant times the, the definite integral of that function. This just comes from the fact that we can do this with antiderivatives, but it also means that if we were to take our picture of looking at an area, but then scale up our function, it will scale up the area in the same proportion. This seems pretty reasonable in terms of areas. It's a little bit more tricky to think of how how the summation formula will work in terms of areas though. The, the definite integral of a sum of two functions is the same thing as if we take the, the definite integrals of those two functions separately and add them together. In a way what you can say, what you can think of here is that you can kind of stack the area under f and then kind of put the area of g on top of that. And, and you'll actually get the area of the f of x plus g of x. But we, we don't really have to do anything with, with that. We, 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 we can just take it as coming from our, our antiderivatives, from our indefinite integrals. Our third property doesn't have an analog in terms of indefinite integrals, because it's all, it's all going to be about the limits. We're going to take an integral from a to b of, of some function, but then we're going to pick some c, some number c between a and b. In fact, maybe I'll go ahead and draw a picture of what, what's kind of going on here, at least in terms of areas. Though th this will work even if, we, even if we do actually have negative values for our function. So we, we have some c here in the middle somewhere. The integral from a to b is the area under this entire thing. But if we were to just start at c, kind of split that up into two regions, we could talk about the area from a to c and the area from a to, from c to b. And it would make sense that the total area in, underneath this curve would just be the sum of those two areas. And it turns out that is actually the case. The area from a to c plus the area from C to B is exactly the area from A to B. Property 4, we've actually kind of already used this one, the, the integral from A to A of a function just equals 0. This is kind of saying here that if we, we don't go anywhere if we, if we start and stop at the same x value, well, we're just talking about the area of a line segment, and that's supposed to be 0. 
And then finally, the last one that is written in the book is a property, but we should really more take it as a definition. This is saying if we have, actually let me, let me write it this way, if we have an integral from b to a of f of x, it's negative of the integral from a to b of f of x. Now the reason why I, I'm, I want to take this more as a definition is because all of our definitions of the integral, of the definite integral, have been on closed intervals. Um, they're saying from on the closed interval a, b. And this doesn't really make any sense unless a was a smaller one in the first place. So technically one of these would not be, would not have a definition in the, if, in the first place. What we can say is that if we have them kind of in the wrong order, where where the larger number is on the bottom, then we we can put them correct in the back in the correct order by multiplying by a negative. This kind of this does seem a kind of reasonable thing to do, because if we look at our our fundamental theorem formula, we get f of b minus f of a. We can swap the a and b in this formula by just multiplying this by a negative. For the moment, again, just kind of take my word that having the, having the ability to put the limits in the wrong order will actually turn out to be kind of useful. One last thing I want to cover in this particular video is that we can use the, the, the definite integral to also talk about the average value of a function. We think, kind of think about we have some function here. We want to know between a and b, on average, what is this function? Well, we can talk about the area now. And we can kind of think of the, the average as being, being a rectangle, or at least the height of a rectangle, that has the same area under, underneath it. So we could say maybe there's some, some rectangle here. So I probably should make that lower down. Maybe something like that. Some rectangle there where the area inside that rectangle is the same as the area underneath this curve. So if I find the area under the curve, again, that is just our definite integral, and then want to treat that as the area of the rectangle, I do have to kind of divide out by the, the length along our x-axis, the, the width of the, of the rectangle, in order to get that height. Essentially, I, I just get to go ahead and divide by b minus a. Here, we specifically need b to be the, the larger of the two. And that will give us a, a value that we can say is the average of the function. We'll put f sub av. Now, you might not see, see that as actually reasonable. You, maybe it makes perfect sense to you. Um, not really going to get too more into how, the, how this really does make sense. Maybe we'll come back to this, to this idea when we get to um, some, some kinds of, um, let's say, numerical integration, where we can kind of in, interpret in, integrals in terms of, of sums of things. I'm kind of this. This section has been been a little bit weird to me. I'm, I'm more used to 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 using the sums as as more of a starting point rather than jumping straight into the fundamental theorem. But I guess the the book wants to wants to de-emphasize that. I guess because a lot a lot of students find that kind of stuff I don't know boring or tedious. Though I, I think I think it makes things make a little bit more sense later on. I don't know. But we will talk about it in a, in a couple sections, for a little bit at least. I'm going to go ahead and move our examples into, an, into another video, though. Um, and we'll get to actually figure out how this stuff actually works. How, how, how do we put all this stuff into practice? So I'll see you there.